Ladies and gentlemen, welcome in. I'm Robbie. I'm Jason. And welcome to the table. We are so excited to have you guys here. Uh, still just thinking about the fact, Jason, it, it feels like because we recorded them, like we recorded his interview a week before we actually did the episode, it feels like our last episode in its entirety was ages ago. Right. I, I agree. But it's it's a weird thing because I was thinking about it today because, I, I mean, I can easily just sit and talk about board games. So prepping for this wasn't very hard. But at the same time, like we, we just interviewed Jamie. I could just take a break for like a couple months because it was just I'm still riding that high, you know. So but I agree. It feels like it's been like forever just because the way the timing is gone. And the next one will feel shorter because of we're going to have to actually record in less than two weeks because of a MCO going on at the disc golf tournament we'll both be at in a couple weeks. So how are yeah, you doing, man? It's hey, doing swell, doing swell. We uh, it has been it's a fun, fun time around our house. Uh, we we just had uh, and I'm sure like I know Ryan listens to this podcast, but yeah. we just had uh, an, another couple over for a game night. Um, and I have been spending a lot of time with them because they're a board gaming or they're a disc golfing couple who also enjoys board games, but they're also video gamers. So cool. I have been playing several games with them uh, to the point of we played uh, a game called Played Up, which is like Overcooked, which will be familiar to Play, oh, Plate the Up. Now I get it. Plate yeah. Up. Okay. Yeah. So Plate Up. Uh, it think like overcooked, but you get to build the menu of what you're like cooking type yeah. deal. And yeah. you like progressively get harder that way. Um, and so like we had a story where we, I played with Ryan and Abby and we opened a pizzeria in that game. And so the next day we went and played disc golf with one of our other friends, Justin. Uh, and we kept talking about like burning pizza. Yeah. And Justin was like, how often do you guys get together? And uh, <laughs> like cook pizza, we're like, yeah. Oh no 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 no! It's a, it's a video game. It's a video game. So, um, yeah, it was. It's a wild time, but we just had a couple over for a game night. So if if it doesn't bother you, Jason, I'll just jump in uh, yeah, to go. games we've been playing lately because we got to play with them. Uh, so uh, we played Call to Adventure, which is a game that we introduced or I introduced Jason and Elizabeth to last time I was up there. Uh, and I know we've talked about it here on the podcast, so I won't like dive too deep into it, but it's a really fun, um, I think it's a really fun alternative to dice chucking. It's like dice chucking meets set collection is how, yeah. now that I've like introduced it to a couple more people lately, just because you have a lot of people can get really frustrated with raw dice chucking. Uh, I don't want the dice to control me. What if I'm having bad rolls, things like that? Well, in call to adventure, you're building a character's story. And so as you build this story, you gain attributes. And then when you go to tackle other challenges, those attributes influence how many runes you can roll. And the runes literally are these like little, to me, they're like shark teeth, uh, but they're these little plastic, like white tile things that you can, um, that have marks on both sides and some get your points, some don't. Uh, and you're casting those to see how many points you get in attempting a challenge. So super, super fun. Uh, definitely plays incredibly well at two players. It's a game that if you have like any D and D background or fantasy background, I think like it and role player to me are easy hobby game, like jump in because they're simple at their base, but they also, the theme is so well packed into it that yeah. you'll like, you'll enjoy it. I don't know how you feel about that, Jason. Yeah, I agree. Like it, if you're from that RPG world, you could see that connection to, um, called adventure for sure. And I, I liked it a lot because the, the basic called adventure is like the generic fantasy, but it's still that fun fantasy. And you are telling that story. And I remembered when you were talking about this, cause so I thought before, like I won't never buy it. Cause I know you have it, but there's called adventure stormlight archive based on, uh, the way of Kings mm. book series. I'm like a thousand percent. I'll be buying that the same way. I love red rising. I love, I'm yeah. like a third of the way through the third book. I'm just flying through them on audible. And so I'm excited to get, so eventually I will get called adventure to stormlight archives for that very reason. Cause the gameplay is so great. Um, and then it has yeah. the old, that thematic tie to the books. Dude. And I, I'll tell you for the, one thing that we talked about when we like first conceptualized this podcast is like board gamers in general, 
guys are geeky. We're geeky. We're nerdy. Like most board gamers have some element of that. And so it was like, there's fun things that we can end up talking about in this section, whether it be like video games we played, board games we played, or even books we're reading. So like Jason is approaching the Cosmere from Way of Kings and I'm approaching it from Mistborn, uh, which from yep. my understanding, if you're going to dive into the Cosmere, like those are the two, like the two trilogies you yep. dive into. Um, yeah. So, uh, that's, a, that's incredible. Uh, I'll have to tell my brother about, cause I think he's like deep in the Cosmere. So, yeah. um, but so we also played a game called five tribes, mm. which I don't know if we have talked about five tribes, but five tribes is a classic. Um, Jason playing this game, it like, it made me, cause we were trying to decide between it and champions of Midgar. Yeah. And Lindsay was like, Five Tribes is way easier than Champions in Midgar. We should go with Five Tribes. And I was like, I I kind of disagree. Yeah. Uh, like, I think Five yep. Tribes is harder than Champions. And yep. she was like, nah, 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 nah. Because Champions, you're having to figure out, like, when I go here, this does this. When I go yeah. here, this does this. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, but, like, and this one, the moves are so complicated. Right. But it really got me thinking, like, once you're into it, because Ryan was like, after the first two turns, like he outbid me in the first turn. So the the way it kind of works is there's a bunch of um, areas, a bunch of tiles that have different meeples, uh, the little wooden people placed out on them, and all the meeples have different colors. So if you've ever heard of the game Mancala, where you scoop up all the beads and then you drop them out of like one at a time and move around the board – Five Tribes takes that and brings it to the hobby gaming world. So you scoop up all of these meeples and then you drop them one at a time moving from that space. And then you eventually end with a matching color in your hand to another number of matching meeples on that same space. And then you scoop those up. You do the effect of whatever that color is. Reds assassinate. The blues are builders. The greens go to the marketplace. The whites uh, can help you with genies. Like all this different stuff. Uh, so, but in order for each turn, it's also really cool because coins, the currency in the game is a straight up one for one victory point. And so you're like, all right, cool. But you also have to bid on the like turn order yeah. every single turn so you can get the move that you want every turn but also it's going to cost you because you're gonna have to bid on that turn order to make right. sure no one outbids you um and so ryan outbid me like early for turn order and went and like did a move and i was like thinking to myself oh no he's definitely gonna take this because like i saw like a 30 point turn with a builder yeah and i was like sick okay so i i bid pretty decent i bid midway up the bid track and ryan outbids me and then does an entirely different move first but it wasn't like and ryan will tell you after this like it wasn't a good move he just did another move right and then i was like thank you ryan thank you so much for that dude <laughs> and then i moved and dropped my pieces and then uh his wife was like ryan why don't you do that <laughs> he's like i, I didn't see it i didn't uh, see like, it right that's it so. and so yeah. From that point, he just was like, all right, I'm going to lose this game. Right. Like I, I'm going to lose so that the next time I can be prepared to win this. And I think five tribes definitely plays that way. Like it, it would be really tough. I think to have someone play five tribes and win their first time out. If they're playing with anyone else that's ever played it before. Right. It um, is because there's so many of those different meeples, the different care, the different tribes do so many different things and depending on which track you want to go on is uh is tough i love five tribes it is one of my all-time favorite we haven't played it in a long time but i could easily yeah. just like we don't even gotta look at the rules like the expansions we have to double check the rules but the base rules like throw it out here's what you do let's go but i agree on the surface it seems like it's an easier game to learn and play than a worker placement game like um like champions of midgard but if you have if you play with someone who struggles with decisions i.e analysis paralysis then five tribes will come to a screeching halt because they're like, I could go here 
or I could do this. Because what what makes the board the game great for hardcore gamers? Oh, it just hit my elbow. Sorry for for our listeners. I have a bum oh, elbow right okay. now, and I just caught it because I got excited because I was talking about five drives. I got a. I even have it's off screen, but my elbow sitting in an ice pack right now. But what makes it great for gamers who love gaming? There's so many options. Like a traditional worker placement game, eventually spots get taken. But in five tribes early in the game, you can pretty much go anywhere, almost go anywhere and do anything because there's so many people on the board. So you're trying to do your biggest move for your your biggest bang for your buck. Get the most assassins, get the most of the blue guys, get the most viziers, whatever you want to do, right? But because there's so many options, folks, and I have people in my mind who are just there, okay, if I do this, I could do that. If I do this, I could do that. Or I could do this, or I could do this, but then I'd do this thing here and like, they're like, come on. And in their defense, they may be thinking, like, for, for folks who struggle for analysis paralysis, always say, try to have at least two moves in your head. But five tribes, mm. if somebody does something, it could entirely change the board because they're moving around the meeples you were going to use. So even I would defend that, that for got folks who struggle with analysis paralysis in five tribes, it's hard. Like, you want to have a couple moves in, set in your mind. But then if the two people before you take moves that mess with those meeples, you're like, well, crap, that just messed up my entire turn. Um, so because of that, yeah. the complications or the challenges for analysis process could be a longer game and a more challenging game for sure. Because um, I saw like yeah. you and I were texting that you're probably going to play Champions of Midgar. I was like, well, cool. And then I saw you did Five Tribes. It's like, okay. But it's on the surface, I agree. It's like, okay, it's less places to go, but there's so many meeples that can do so many things and you can go for gins to get the bonus for gins or you can just do the, I'm a racer. I race as fast as I can to empty this box to put my camo down. That's always been my strategy. The cool thing about, I can talk about five yeah. tribes. I'm hijacking your conversation. I apologize, Robbie, but five tribes is fantastic at two players as well. Like it's amazing how it good, because you're basically controlling two, two, you're basically, it's almost like you're playing with two players in a traditional Three yeah. to five player game, you have, you're taking a move, then somebody goes a move, then you go move. But if you're playing two players, you're essentially, you are doing two different moves per round, but you're bidding on what those are. Now, what Robbie said, you have to bid for turn order. You can always bid zero, but in the two player game, yeah. you, someone has to bid a dollar. Like there's not an option. Someone has to do it. Cause if all the zero bids are taken, you have to bid a dollar. So. At least a dollar. Yeah, yeah. And, and the we famous and the zero the zero thing so fascinating too yeah. because if like that specific one is if you let's say like Jason is second in the turn order and I like I go first and I bid three coins. Okay, so I'm two tracks up on the bid order. So right now someone has to bid five, eight, twelve, or fifteen or something yeah. in order to pass me, which is a huge investment. Yeah. Uh, and so. Like I'm there. So then Jason goes second and he's like, you know what? I'm good. I'm just going to bid zero. So if he drops in at zero, the next person that bids zero jumps Jason. Like Jason gets scooted back. So it's like, if you decide, Hey, I'm going to go zero early. That's fine. But then you just open the door for everyone else who's bidding behind you to then pass you in the turn order, yeah. which is so cool. Yeah, which and that's what in some ways I, I we've played like some of these older games again. Learned this from tabletop as well. Will Wheaton, I've played Five Tribes so many times that I just I always bid zero. Always because I like the challenge for me is can I win saving yeah. those points I just bid. But sometimes there's like Elizabeth famously with when in a two player game of me and her she famously had a a thirty six point move that the very first move because it was the green ones that give you the the commerce cards or whatever they're the called market. yeah the market and so it was yeah. like just based on the because you get because the way the market was laid out and what she already had it was literally a her that single move was 36 points that's a lot of points yeah. for those who if you haven't played five tribes have a single move be 36 when the game may go to 70 or 80 or something whatever i don't I haven't played five tribes in a while but to have a 36 point move that's awesome i'm, I'm glad ryan got to play that for sure because it is it's an og game as well that doesn't yeah. get Hardcore longtime gamers love Five Tribes. It doesn't get talked about a lot, but if they talk about it, like, oh yeah, because there's no, there's so few other, if any, games like that in how you move around the meeples. It's, there's like Moncala type games. There's different actions you can do, but like Five Tribes, there's just not another one that I've know of that plays that way. Yeah, and where people, what like Jason and I play, I would. It's a game that I would love to one day, like if we had like just two people joining or one person joined us for a game night while we're up there, 
Because it, unfortunately, it caps at four unless you have the expansion, yeah. I guess. Yeah, you got to have the expansion, you got to five. Uh, yeah. But like with other people there, because I also with Jason am a racer to get my camels down. Because once you place enough, you, you have these like camels that mark territories. And once that's done, the game's over. Uh, like, and so I, at one point, like I love the assassinate, the assassins can just like, yep. you can scoop up enough assassins that that lets you lay a camel and then you can use the assassin yep. to kill a solo dude and get another yep. camel. Oh yeah. And so I did that two turns in a row and people were like, well, I mean, those were like a six and an eight point, like, all right, cool. And then Lindsay looks up at one point, she was like, what? Yep. Ro Robbie, when did you get down to one camel? Yep. Uh, yep. And I was like, yep uh this game ends next round right. just letting everyone know like i'm gonna bid zero and i will end this because i looked and like when i bid zero i was like i see literally four different moves yeah. that allow me to place a camel so i'm good yeah. uh whatever you do i'm good yeah <laughs> oh yeah for sure so for sure what y'all play game. jason so we i actually got two two new games to the table for me I almost talked about um, Welcome, Let's Go to Japan, which I texted you about, but that'll be another one. We're going to play that one yeah. again, and I'll have to talk it another time because it's so good. But it, So the first game I'll talk about is actually an, it, an older game, worker placement game. Jamie actually mentioned on our episode called Zulkin the Mayan Calendar. And it's okay. It's such an interesting game. It's from the same designers, I think, as Teotihuacan or similar, the whole two series of games. But the unique thing about this one is that your workers go out on a gear – and then as the, at the end of the round, in the turn, which is essentially a round where everybody plays out, you can play as many workers as you want, but the more workers you play, you have to pay more corn to put them out based on the number you put out and what number on the gear you put them on. At the end of the round, the gear turns one spot. And then so you on your turn, you're either placing a worker or you're pulling a worker. When you pull a worker, wherever spot that worker is, you take that action. And that's the entire game. Like way more going okay. on than that. But you're either yeah. placing a worker or pulling a worker. And that's it. That's all you do the entire game. But there's so many, there's one whole track and I forgot the names of it, but there that you just can get corn and wood. There's one where you can get just other resources like, like, like wood, like stone, like gold and more corn. There's, there's buildings you can buy that give you real time bonuses. There's monuments you can get by that give you in game bonuses. There's crystal skulls. Um, Definitely the same kind of crystal skulls from that really bad Indiana Jones movie, but in the game, yeah, it's really yeah, good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that you put on this other track that gives you really big points. There's temple tracks you can go up. Um, Elizabeth and I have played it three times, twice now. We, we played it again last night. So we played it twice in the last week. And I love it, but it's it's a timing. Like I've never played a worker replacement game that was timing was so important. Because when we played last night, on my very last turn, I literally had nothing to do. She pulled a bunch of people and ended up beating me by like two points. But I had nothing to do because the previous turn, the way the gears had lined out, I needed to pull my workers then. You can always pull a worker from one spot and pay corn to take action on a previous spot on the gear, but I didn't have enough corn. And you got to have corn to feed your family. You have to you have to pay, you have to feed your workers four times in the game. There's a specific mm. place on the gear. When this gear, when this spot on this gear hits at the end of this turn, you have to you have to spend your corn. Or it's minus three points per worker you don't feed. And so I totally, both games we played, the first game she smoked me by like 20 points. And the last night she beat me by two, 45 to 43. But it was, um, it's, it's so, it's so interesting. Cause I, I can see this. I, I would not want to play this with someone who struggles from AP because there's so much going on. Even for us, we're like, we've never gone up the track here. Like the, the temple track, there's the temples that have big points on it. We never really go high on that. Well, one game we're going big on buildings and this other one we're going big on corn. And we, well, we never go high on corn actually. So anyway, so that's, that's Zulk in the Myron calendar. It's actually a 12 year old game, but if you wow. look at it, you could be like, Oh, that could actually be published today. Maybe the art could be wow. a little jazzier, but if you see Zulkin, it's one that could be published today. It's in the top 100 of BGG for I'm pretty sure it's in the top 100 for BGG for a reason. Um, it's that unique mechanism of place a worker, take a worker, time it out. So you pull that worker when you want it to get pulled. And it's really cool because it actually has plastic gears that go on the board that you permanently put on the board mm. and, and spin. So super cool. It's I, I actually got it in a board game exchange for Christmas from like a Secret Santa from one of the board game things I'm on. And so I was excited to get that. So it's definitely, I mean, there's, it's, all, it's on the long list of games we definitely want to show you at some point. But I've never seen a worker yeah. placement game like that, that it's time-based for your workers, which is really cool. That's sick. Yeah. 
The other game we played, which is appropriate for this episode, is, is a co-op game. Elizabeth and I don't play a lot of co-op games because you've been around Elizabeth enough. Elizabeth doesn't want you to touch her worker, much less help her make her decision in a board game move. From anybody, it doesn't matter. It could be Mandy, her best friend in the world. If Mandy tries to tell Elizabeth what to do, she'll give her a nice smile and then do what she wants, right? So cooperative yeah. games is not really Elizabeth's thing. But we saw Adventure Robin Hood is a very unique cooperative game it's a story story slash narrative based game you basically have a storybook and that in your you have a storybook that you're following through for each of your days each of your campaigns you're doing because it's actually a campaign type game replayable you're not putting stickers down you're not writing anything down the board but you're like okay let's go you know steal some gold or whatever and you can play up to four characters but there has to be at least two in every game like they have robin hood made marianne little john and I know we've only, those are only three we've actually played. Anyway, so the unique thing about this is that you put all these, the gameplay teaches you how to play the game as you go. So the very first mission, like the rule book just says, Hey, open the book and follow this. And it teaches you how to play as you go, which is cool. So there's no rule book to read ahead of time because it's telling you how to go. And okay. the cool thing about this is like, Often in cooperative games, you're just kind of going in clockwise order. You just figure out what order you want to go, and you go in that order all the time. And this one, there's a bag that you put basically a little disc in there, the color of each player, and you're randomly pulling them out each each round. So the turn order may be different every single round. So Robin Hood may have gone last one round. We finish mm-hmm. it up, and then beginning of the next round, put everything back in, pull the disc out. Oh, Robin Hood goes first. So it's kind of cool that you don't necessarily know who's going first or second each time. And there's also discs that go in that everybody gets to take a turn. All the good people get to take one turn in any order they want. And there's one where only one of y'all take a single turn. But the other cool thing about this is that it's it's a advent calendar type board. And when I say advent calendar, people know advent calendars are like you open up a little door and there's something behind it. And this board, yeah. you're basically pulling out cardboard pieces and turning them over during the game based on what the book tells you to do. It would say turn over like you know parts 11 15 and 22 and you turn them over and there's guards there so now there's guards in that particular area on the board where you're moving through and and mm. later on I say okay we'll turn over you may turn those same ones back over or turn over new ones that are things to go investigate because on your turn you're basically moving around to go investigate to go and talk to people to go attack guard to go try to steal things and it also has another cool movement mechanism that it's basically the little wood pieces that have different sizes, different shapes, and those distances that you lay those out on the board, and that's how far you can move on a single turn. Just sort of interesting. Like it's not too different in yeah. Warhammer 40k. Those kinds of mini games have distance-based things. You're pulling out your measuring tape. Well, this one is a version of that. It just has set wood pieces that tell you how far you can go. And then if you choose to walk less that day, you can put a white cube in the bag, which is you, when you do combat, you're pulling out these little bitty square cubes. And then if you pull out purple ones, you're losing the combat. If you pull out white ones, you win. It's very cool because it's a bag builder, but there's different things in the bag that you pull out at different times because they're different shapes. You know what you're trying to pull out. There's a lot going on. It's much easier to play than probably I described it there. I'm not a big, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big narrative game player because they're often co-op and my wife doesn't do co-op games, but she seemed yeah. to like that. So at least open the door for doing some other games with heavy story this this is a perfect if i'd had this game when my kids were young it'd been fantastic to sit down have a fun little mm. story-based adventure they get to make decisions they know in general the story of robin hood from both disney and major movies they know robin hood so just getting to play these characters go around and do those things was was super cool and i had a good time with it dude i i feel you on the co-op world uh which is what makes this uh this episode special because you you know it's a good game when we're both married to non-co-op players, and uh, I feel like it's not hard to get this game to the table. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Hey, guys, I'll just go ahead and tell you. I'll defend Jason here. Some <laughs> of the games we play, it's like if you could see it, it's so much easier. Yeah. Like that, there, no doubt. But like even uh, Zolkin you've got to say a lot of words in order to paint the picture of it. Because when Jason sent me a picture of the board, I was like, that looks insane. Yeah. Uh, like <laughs> before he even, before the text had come with the picture that then said, my head hurts a little bit after playing this one. 
I could have told you my head would hurt a little bit and I didn't even know how it worked. I just saw the board. Yeah. So, uh, we, we tried to, the, the point of the section is a, to show that we're what games we're interested in right now. Uh, and then also like that, Hey, maybe you're, maybe you're an avid listener and you are coming up, uh, and like, Hey, I, I'm interested in other stuff. Um, I know for instance, on, uh, our podcast reviews, uh, something we want to keep you guys updated with. Uh, we are actually at 22 reviews on iTunes and we are at 28 reviews on, uh, Spotify. So combined, we have a giveaway. Unfortunately, they're not combined because they're two different <laughs> giveaways, y'all. So we have two copies of quacks that we want to give to you, the listeners. And in order to unlock those, we just have to reach 50 reviews on either Spotify or eight, Spotify will unlock its own giveaway. And then iTunes reviews will lock up their own giveaway. So uh, make sure if you want to check those out, I wanted to, um, uh, Ape Harris said, the passion comes through with these gentlemen in board gaming and disc golf, where I was first introduced to Robbie and Jason. As an avid Frisbee chucker and tabletop enthusiast, these two are a good fun to listen to and not just because of the disc golf correlation. I'd like to be clear, these aren't two disc golfers who dabble in board games. They know their stuff, and it clearly shows. I highly recommend it if you're dipping your toes in the tabletop or if you have a cardboard collecting addiction like Jason or myself. I, I do like that. that he called you for the, the cardboard it collecting addiction. It is true. <laughs> I'm not there yet. I guess you got to clear 200 games. It is, to, uh, it is true. Like I have done... Uh, someone posted in one of the discords, I think the foundation discourse, somebody posted about a game they got. And I even commented how I really wanted it, but it was expensive. And really it's because I have too many games. It's not quite the expensive. I spent plenty of money on games. I've done well this year. I've only bought, I've only bought, uh, worm spam is the only game I've bought. Now I've had kickstarters. I've had to close out the shipping and all that. Right. But I've actually no. only intentionally bought worm spam. So in three months, three and a half months, January, February, March. Yeah, three months, over three months. I have only bought one game, which is like a record. I like to go that long without buying any games. I just had a Kickstarter get delivered today. Let's go to Japan got delivered. I had a Kickstarter get delivered a couple weeks ago. So I have a bunch of Kickstarters getting delivered, but I've already paid for those. So we're doing pretty good. Yeah. So my uh my veiled fate uh Kickstarter yeah. just got collected like an hour ago. Yeah, I saw, so, it. I saw uh, it go through. So it was uh I'm excited. I'm very excited, y'all. Uh, that's a game that I I bought the metal components of everything. That's exciting. Uh, and then, so I'm I'm excited because the next like when they arrive, I w- I was gonna say like that's the hard part if you're getting into this, and we're gonna dive into our game here uh, in just a second. But if you get into the kickstarting world, it's both a fun blessing and such a heartache at the same time because like I just okay, so I just paid money yeah. to get these components. And then you heard me subtly slip and be like, oh, so the next time that I play Veiled Fate, it's going to be incredible. And that's just not how Kickstarter works. Yeah, no. It won't be the next time. <laughs> It'll be when I play next year. Yeah. It's going to be incredible. Um, yeah, I, even, but, I even have a note section. Like, I just pulled it up because it's, it, that's the life of Kickstarter. Because you're crowdfunding games. For those who don't know, probably so much they do. Kickstarter is basically how somebody crowdfunds their game. Hey, I got this really cool game I want to make. Make it with me. Help me. Help make it with me. Might give me money ahead of time. And so sometimes you'll have stuff that takes it in it. And they project it's usually a year to year and a half. Sometimes they're way late. I have one I've mentioned before that is now on four years. It's four years late. And it's the only one. It's the one I've spent the most money on. I went insanely all in because I backed it during COVID. And it's still, but it got delivered to China and like the, the comment section is crazy, but also on my phone, I have a note section of just inbound games. Cause I forget I backed so many games in the past that I had to go up and be like, Oh, well, I have slay the spire, the board game, unconscious mind, firefighters on duty, fromage, critter kitchen. Like I have undergrove, I have another a bunch of games that are inbound right now. But when they show up, I even used to track when they were supposed to go and like they never met their date. So I just quit. There's no point in even tracking. Eventually they don't show up. So. Well, y'all, we uh, we have an incredible game for you uh, in Marvel United. Uh, what what a just a great experience that we have in front of us. So this is I was trying to think through our episodes. This is our heaviest like IP game that we've played so far, right? Yeah. Like I don't know yeah. that we have anything else that's been like. Oh yeah, nothing, nothing from the like outside this. IP wise. Right. 
Yeah. Smash Up has, so, a, has some in there, but it's not the same because they're just kind of random ones as yeah, opposed yeah. to the whole game is focused on that, this IP. Yeah. Yeah. And even Smash Ups are like the times that they get real close to it are yeah. still rip offs. Uh, yeah. like in a and they jokingly ripped it off like instead of game of thrones it's like not again what instead of transformers it's changer bots <laughs> um so marvel united when it comes to the uh the ip of it all and i will go ahead and preface this because i told uh, a friend about like he's like hey what are y'all doing for your episode tonight and i was like marvel united and he said i feel like when you go into a game with Marvel or something like that, it's so hit or miss. Like when the IP is so rich, yeah. how do you, an intellectual property, that's what we're saying with IP. Um, like when that is coming in, it can sometimes a, a an okay game, the IP can be so good that it makes a great, it makes it seem like a great game when in reality it may not be. Uh, right. Villainous is a great example of a game that, yeah. like Jason and I, the IP is top tier. But like, I I'm not sure when I look at the holistic view of Villainous that I'm like, it's the greatest game design I've ever seen. Um, right. Like it's, and that's not me saying it's bad. It's just, right. it's different. Uh, there are woes that come with that that I can easily overlook. Because of, I love Disney villains. So, uh, in Marvel United, uh, guys, we've got, I mean, it's just, it's so good. So good. And it's really not that old. That was another thing is that like, when I looked at it, it felt fresh. Uh, Jason, you want to take us through some details? Yeah, for sure. I will. So like you just referenced, it was released in 2020 and it's a, it's a very unique release. So it has a Kickstarter that came out in 2019, 2020, and it took over a year for it to fulfill, but because of the way the retail side works, it actually got released at like Walmart before the Kickstarter delivery ever got it. It's a whole separate thing altogether. Some of the very early reviews of it were people went to Walmart because they didn't have their actual deliveries yet. Because they they knew they knew, I think it was one of those things they knew they had a good game on their hand. Walmart bought it before it ever was released. Like they bought it out when it was part of that Kickstarter thing as did Target. And so that's why it's been around for a while, but it got a bigger release in 2021 because the expansion just started hitting. Designed by Eric Lang and Andrea Chiarvesio. I don't know Andrea Chiarvesio, but gamers will know Eric Lang because he's done just a ton of stuff. He's known for big heavy games like, excuse me, like Blood Rage, like, um, oh my gosh. Ankh, he just released a game called Ankh. He's, re- he's released other heavy games before in the past, like super heavy games. And he's, he's, he's dabbled in a lot of the latter games as well. It's published by Simon and Spin Master Games. And it's one to four players and plays in less than 30 minutes. That, that already is an awesome thing. <laughs> in Marvel United, you take the role of iconic Marvel heroes cooperating to stop the master plan of a powerful villain controlled by the game so basically you're playing as the heroes and the game is the villain so who you're playing each villain unveils their unique master plans they have unique requirements for how they win or lose how they win or lose the game and they have cards that trigger those different effects and threats that pose challenges across locations you have six locations on the board that you have to go take actions at heroes must choose carefully the cards they play from their hands which come from their own each unique deck every hero has their own unique deck they offer different actions that superpowers use, but also combine the actions of other heroes to do the impossible. Defeat that villain. You build your storyline, you unite your powers, you save the day. Super cool. It's on, on your turn. I mean, to, that was a lot of, that was like kind of the tagline. I kind of copy and paste that from some stuff I saw online, but it still captures the game. On your turn, yeah. like I said before, every player, every hero you choose. So there's in the base game that we'll that we're talking from. Saint Robbie and I have the same one. There's seven heroes in there. You choose a hero, and they all have their own unique deck. And you start the game with three cards in your hand. You choose who goes first. And now on your turn, you draw a card. So you draw up to four cards. But if you get damaged later on, you could have less than that. And you play that card, and you take the actions on the bottom of that card. Super easy, super, super clean, super easy to understand. There's only four things that can even happen on that. You can do a move action, and they're all icons on top of that. Super easy icons to follow, which are super cool. I'm using super a lot because they're superheroes, so I guess it just kind of goes into play. Hey, um, I think it's a super idea. Super. Um, you can move. 
You can attack, which is a, a fist with a little pow symbol. Very cool. You can do heroic action, which is how you save civilians and do other things. Or there's also a wild card um, icon. That means you can do any of those, any of the other three things. That's it. As a hero, that's the four actions you can do. So you play that card, those, and you take those actions. They're su- the super, super, super. The very unique. The fun thing about this is now the next player, when he or she plays their card, they're using the actions from the previous player's card as well as the cards they just played. So yeah, the very first player of the game probably has the most boring move in the entire game because they only get to do the actions off their card. But the rest of the game, whenever you play a card, you're also taking the actions of the card that came before you. So if Robbie played two punches and we needed to knock out the villain on this particular spot, well, I already know I have two punches, so maybe I want to move and punch somewhere else because I could take his two punches on my current spot and then move and punch in somewhere else. That's where the, the cooperative nature of that comes into play so well because you're talking through what you have in your hand because it is very much open communication on this one. And if, if I'd had this with my kids 10 years ago, we'd have played with the cards in front of us out so we all can see what we have yeah. to teach that kind of game strategy level. And you take those actions, and that's what you do. That Now, another... The way the villain plays against you is every three cards. So after three players have played their cards, the villain comes out and the villain has a, you just have a randomized deck for each villain. You come out and play it. And that villain may, may move to a different location because he, he starts at a location. He may attack or he may add villain or add civilians and thugs. So one of the goals of the game is also to rescue civilians and knock out thugs as well. <clears throat> so randomly as that villain's deck comes up, it it helps drive the game so that you're not just blowing everybody away, right? It continues to pose those new challenges. Heroes have to complete two missions before they... Ultimately, the way you beat each villain is to knock them out. And each villain has different yep. requirements for how you can get to them. But ultimately, you have two of three... You have to complete two missions before you can attack the villains. They're always the same. The three missions are rescue nine civilians, knock out nine thugs, or... Um, the clear four areas. You have six locations on the board to do actions to heroic actions to clear basically those threats. And as soon as you've cl- done two of those objectives, you now can attack the villain. Now the villain has unique win conditions for them because if they, if their condition is met, you automatically lose. If you're knocked the villain out, you automatically win. Very black and white. There's no question. Like the three villains are in the game. It's very black and white whether you're going to lose or win, right? On, on that condition yeah. that comes up. Um, that's basically the game. The villain, like for example, the game Liz and I played a couple of days ago, we were playing Ultron. And basically if every single thug and civilian spot on the board was full, you automatically lose. Or if you knock mm. out Ultron, Ultron, you automatically win. We, we knocked out Ultron. We're like, oh, that seemed like a really fast game. But then we looked at the board like, oh, wow, we only had two spots left before we were going to lose because we just didn't realize how close we were to losing. So we were so focused on attacking Ultron because we were taking care of our objectives really quick. But Ultron, one of his actions when on his cards is to put more thugs and civilians out. And like, even though we thought, oh, that seemed way too easy. We beat him really fast. Like, oh, wow. On the next turn, he probably was going to win. So I, I love that surprise to us in the game because you kind of, it's easy to lose track of what that villain's doing during the game. Yeah. It's uh, I, like, it's so well balanced in terms of there are like, when we think of, when we say the word balance in a game, like are there multiple ways to win? Like, are there certain things that are just super overpowered um, and overpowered in the sense of like, why would you ever do anything other than that? Or, Oh, this person is in the game. Therefore they just win kind of a deal. Now there are heroes that have technically like probably better decks. Like there are some heroes that are much more supporty. uh, And so you need to have like, a Hulk alongside them to actually punch and all that. Um, I know like, for instance, there is um, a set on Amazon that you can purchase that comes with not only like the base game. And we'll talk about expansions here in a little bit, because the expansions, I actually think take this game to an entirely different level. Um, And they're very affordable, which is awesome. Like, especially because we've talked about some more expensive games the last couple of weeks uh, or last couple episodes. Um, But like Jason, the reason I have it, Jason got it for me for Christmas. And so he got me, it was a Spider-Man expansion and uh, the base game, but that combo also included Dr. Strange. So the first time we played my wife, big black widow fan. So she mm-hmm. played as black widow um, because playable characters in the base game, you've got captain America, iron man, black widow, 
Captain Marvel, Hulk, Wasp, Ant-Man. And then your villain options are Red Skull, Ultron, and Taskmaster. Um, I love that they threw Taskmaster in there because I feel like overlooked uh, in the villain, like in the Marvel Universe, um, even inside of Black Widow's movie. Right. I still feel like Taskmaster was just kind of there. Um, so like all about the character. So I played as Dr. Strange because it also came with like this combo came with the Dr. Strange figure, which included the figure in the deck and all that. The minis are incredible here. Get inside sidetracked because there's so many fun things to talk about with this game. Y'all. Uh, but we played and we realized we struggled mightily because Dr. Strange is a support character and black widow is like a hybrid She's not really going to carry a game, but also like she can help out quite a bit. And so there is an ending feature where if you run out of cards to draw, like you have, you're on a time limit to get this, like this done. Um, Because when you're playing your cards, they call it the storyline and you're laying them out in a circle around the board. And so eventually you're going to run out of cards. And therefore, if you run out of cards, you ran out of time, villain wins. Uh, so, uh, we were like, Lindsay, I, I don't know. If we're going to do this. Uh, like we're going to have to, like, I hope you've got some punches left because we, we have <laughs> got to take care of this guy. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, I don't think I have any left in my deck. Uh, so there is like the balancing is done really well there. Um, and that, like Jason said, like, I, I totally get that. And like, Oh, that felt easy. Wait a minute. No, like. We definitely almost lost. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, it's, yeah, it's extremely well done and you get immersed in it really fast. But I think before we go like deeper, we kind of have to, we've talked about our wives are not big fans of co-op games. And I know for Lindsay, it's because of quarterbacking. Yeah. She got quarterbacked in a game and it pushed her off of it that genre entirely. So Jason, you want to talk about quarterbacking with co-ops? Yeah, for sure. Like that's a, Robbie mentioned it. It's, it's a common for people who play a lot of games. Quarterbacks essentially where someone, if you, if you know American football, the quarterback is guy, basically the guy who runs the team, calls the plays, essentially tells everybody where to go, what to do and when they're doing offense. Right. And so in, in board gaming, quarterbacking is where one guy or gal tries to tell everybody else what they should do and what they should play during a game. And it is, it puts a lot of people off for, for co-op games for sure. I, without doubts, confessing my sins here, right? I was a bad quarterback in early days of gaming, right? Especially with the kids, as opposed to letting them learn how to play. I was just telling them what to play with Elizabeth as well. And so I do, I don't, I almost to an opposite extent don't do that hardly at all now with quarterbacking. And I just wanted to, I almost play pure support team, pure wide receiver. Hey, tell me what you want to do. You want to play something? Let's just go, right? Unless I see them still mating. Because Brent Ryder and I have played Pandemic Legends of Season 1, Pandemic Legends of Season 2. He really likes the Pandemic series. And Pandemic is very similar because you're all working together to take actions. And you have to communicate with each other about what you can do and what you're able to do and what you want to do in your turn. Now, in a cooperative game, you don't have to. If, if you want to win the game, you need to work together. You don't have to. You could just do what you want and say, <laughs> I, I know you just played two punches, but I really want to move and do something else. And I'm not even going to punch it all, right? That's That's... That's what co- that's what cooperative games are fun about. There's a lot of great cooperative games out there for sure, like um, Forbidden Island, Forbidden Desert. Lots of ones we played with our family that help teach that concept for sure of how to work together. In in Marvel United, there's because you have your own cards that you're playing to take your own action and you're utilizing someone else's action. There's less of the chance someone can try to quarterback, but they don't know what's in your hand and they can only go off what's right there, right? What's right in front of them. And though it's a, it's all a common goal to go do these things. There's so many little actions on the board and so many little spots you need to go to go do heroic actions or rescue civilians or take care of thugs that you need to kind of work together. If you want to be efficient and, and win, you need to work together, but you can really talk through those things because your decks are so different because the, you may have a, a very support, like, like you said, Ant-Man's very much a support guy as well. Wasp is very much a support guy. We played a game with Ant-Man and Wasp and it was tough. I, I think we may have lost. Maybe we barely won, but if we won, it was barely because we're like, oh, wow, I have a lot of moves. And a lot of heroic yeah. actions, but not a lot of punches. Well, I can't really win if I don't have punches. So that's what what in the cooperative game world, quarterback is that way. In Marvel United, I think helps because you can still go do your own actions. 
and you have your own set of deck of cards, you know, all unique abilities that it kind of limits that ability or kind of helps eliminate some of that, some of those challenges. Yeah. And you're, there's, there's communication that obviously occurs like technically in some of the quarterback, like in, in a lot of the co-op games, they discourage you from like, Oh, I have three punches in my hand. So if you've got moves, don't worry, I've got punches coming. Or yeah. if you want to play moves this turn, I'll be able to punch next turn. Like they kind of try to discourage that a little bit. I think Marvel United does not say much in the rule book about like trying to make sure your information stays hidden. And also to add some complexity to this game, because I think some people are going to hear it and be like, oh, so you're just running around punching and moving and all that. Like even the cards in your hand have like special abilities as well. Like some are just raw just punches, just right. moves, just heroic actions. And then others are like, okay, I have this effect. And so I get to jump to spaces like as a teleport or something like that. Dr. Strange had a lot of movement type like bonuses that were really cool. Um, so there is some, definitely some complexity to that. And it is cool finding what heroes really do work really well together. Like I'd imagine if you went with like, two of the bigger guys who are trying to punch everything the whole time, you would still struggle. If you like, if you had captain Marvel and Hulk side by side, two heavy hitters. Yep. Great. Now we're not moving. Right. Uh, so I do, it's just, and also like captain Marvel and Hulk just punching could work really well against red school because that's much more of a fighting setup, but like taskmaster, you're having to move a lot. So it's, it's, it's really really well done and how it balances around um each of the pieces now another thing that i personally really like is i love the minis yep i think the minis are just the art style itself is very i'm i'm a funko pop collector i know jason has some funko pops i know lots of folks who are funko pop collectors and it's like funko pops meet a modern comic book is how I would describe this because it's like big head type deal, little bodies, but it's super edgy is the wrong word. But it's it's like it's such a unique art style carried to the game and it's so beautiful. And if you're someone who loves to paint minis and all that, like my minis are never going to get painted. <laughs> I just know that's a fact. Yep. Uh, but if I were into that, that is a whole new layer that this game brings like I could easily see a world that Jason's like, Hey, you know, you got passing it off to any of his children. Cause they all paint right. like you guys want to make our Marvel United look even better. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. I've thought about actually paying them to paint before as well, because it just takes, once you get into painting, it's not a big deal. Cause they all paint because right. Xander with his Xander with his um, Warhammer 40 K and then will and Hannah because of their D and D prowess and, and will still paints a lot. So I'm like, I thought about commission them how much, but I mean, it takes a while for each one. So I don't want to spend that kind of money, but I agree. Like I will hold it up to our YouTube viewers. Like Ant-Man is so cool. Cause he's on a quarter and it's just, he's my favorite looking character it just looks so fun and it's the yeah. the style that robbie's talking about it's i guess it's called the chibi style i don't know where the history yeah. of that chibi style is but the bigger head and what i when you were describing that artwork i was trying to think about it but it really it's a good mix of um not cartoonish not kiddish but um capturing the essence of who they are in a comic book style, but not rough and edgy, but also not kiddish. Like, cause there's kiddish Marvel stuff we see and there's like really edgy yeah. stuff. And it's like, it's right. It's right in between there. And like, I think you captured it well. Like it's, it's, it's that good balance of those things. And I, and I'm not a Marvel fan, so I don't have the history of how they look or what makes, what looks good and what doesn't. I know the Marvel cinematic universe, the MCU, but not their comic universe. Um, but I think the artwork is great, and the the production, like I said, the minis are are amazing for sure. Even the artwork on the cards, it's your, it's it's a replenish of what's what's on the board, but it's 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 very nice. Um, it's not. It gives good homage to the to the Marvel universe for sure. So it's not a caricature of anything. It's just a different interpretation of those things. One of the things I was going to talk about, you mentioned earlier was that the, how the cards give you the different strategy. Cause each, you may have support cards. So like Robbie said, each player, each hero has some unique cards, lets them do things. And that's how I grabbed a couple out. Cause they are very thematic, which is when you really think about it, cause there's one called Hulk smash, 
where only Hulk can use this. So this is, it still has the icon on the bottom that anyone else can use and Hulk can use. But then in the middle of the card, it's called Hulk Smash. He deals one damage to everything else in this location. So you could use that card. When you play that card, you're damaging everything once because he did a big, a big smash. That's very thematic to Hulk. Here's another great one, Wasp. On one of her cards called Wings, you may move yourself in any number of heroes from your location. So that means Wasp can grab people and fly them away. Ant-Man has one called Grow, where he his action is move once and then hit three punches against a single target. Well, if you've seen the movie or probably read the comics, that's what he does. Like, cause he, he builds the momentum of those things. And then the last one I'll talk about is Grace, cause Captain America, it's the same card, but it's leadership. He gives a wild token from the pool to another hero. So there's tokens you can give out to that different cards do. So now you can give a wild token to anyone else and then they can now use as an action anytime on their turn. But that's what Captain America does because he inspires people, right? The idea is that he's inspiring you to do great things by his leadership. And as silly as it sounds, they're all very thematic. And then Tony Stark has actually three different cards that do three different things. Whereas a lot of the other heroes have the same card three different times. He actually has three yeah. different cards from combat analysis to helping people move to doing other things. So I like the fact they even kept it as thematic as they could in a family weight game. This is a very, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, in a fantastic way, this is a very lightweight game, easy to play, easy to understand, win or lose, right? It, it's not, even if you're losing, it's just because things may come out a certain way, but it's not because you're, it's not because it's super dark or super, the strategy is super tough. It's pretty clear, but the, the way in which your cards come out kind of dictate how well you can play against that game and you can make it harder as you go. I love the fact that it is lightweight, family weight, but a gamer like you and I, like we're a gamer, quote unquote can get in there and love yeah. the strategy of it for sure and not get bored with it because of there's so many different options in there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you literally like Jason and I could sit down and we could be like, all right, Jason's playing Ant-Man every time I'm playing Iron Man every time. All right, cool. And we could just with that combination have three incredibly different gaming experiences by just playing the three other, like the three villains inside of the main set. And one thing that I really love is this was a game that when Lindsay and I learned it for the first time, we were like, okay, let's go downstairs. We're going to play it. Sounds good. But now that like we've played it and we know it, it is easily something that it is lightweight, lightweight enough that if you're with a crew of people that like know it, it plays super fast, which is fantastic. Like with two players, I love um, you can get like a 20 minute game in. Yep. So like a, Oh, we just finished dinner bank. Let's play a game of Marvel United. Uh, or, Oh, we just put this dinner in the oven. We can probably play a game of Marvel United in the meantime, or you can stretch it out because you really don't have to be that focused while you're playing. It obviously helps. Right. But like, I was thinking about this. I don't know if you did Jason, but like a fun world of like, Hey, we're going to take and put the Avengers movie on. Yeah. And we're just going to play one or two games while we watch yep. Avengers. Um, and it, like, I truly, I don't think that it would be a, because all you have to do when you tune back into the game, assess the board, look at what card was played before you and play another one. Right. There you go. It's, it's that easy. I agree. It's not so die hard that you got to pay attention and look at every single thing. It's that quick reassessment, especially once you go. And again, that's not a critique of it. That's a, po that's not a negative critique. That's a positive critique that you can still have such wide variety of gameplay because of the different actions you can take, but streamlined gameplay and easy to understand gameplay. Like you said, the base game comes with seven different heroes, three different villains. That combination alone is, is awesome. But then, like, the, uh, right, even right now, the the one I gave you includes, you mentioned, Into the Spider-Verse and Doctor Strange. It's, I'm jumping a little ahead, but it's 30 bucks on Amazon. So, Marvel yeah. United, the base Marvel United game, that Into the Spider-Verse expansion, which has Spider-Gwen and has Miles in there and has Green Goblin as the villain. You get Doctor Strange, it's just a little standalone guy. Um 30 bucks, right? And for So, for that much gameplay, it, it's one that, too, like, there are some of the game reviewers, like, you know, respectable game reviewers out there who don't, who kind of hate on it, but most give nothing but great props to this because it's, because it's a big box game. It's a Walmart game. You can buy it at Walmart for 23 bucks. You can buy it at Target, at least online. It, it, sometimes you find it in store, but you can find it online. You can find it at those places for less than $30. It's a, 
comic book it's inspired by a comic book but it's not like dark and gritty or bloody or anything controversial at all it's definitely family weight that you're it's a game that you can teach your kids how to the basics of strategy right the basics of co-ops the basics of the way to think you're through that i i love that about um the marvel united like it's I, I repeat this every week. I own way too many games, so I don't get to play Marvel United as much as I'd like. But if I'd had this in the early days, like I played Five Tribes like 30 or 40 times, and like I played Small World 20 or 30 times, Marvel United would have got played a ton. And my kids would have played it a ton, just on their own. They would have busted out and played it. They did a ton of that with Munchkin. Totally different game, but it's the concept. My Your 10 and 11-year-old kids, your 8 and 9-year-old kids could pull this out and play it. That's how easy this yeah. game is to play. Again, not a knock. That's a positive thing because then – couple 40 year olds could play it and have just as much fun yeah and you're like once again on the art style you're not worried about some like super like violent images or whatnot like it's it's so playful but it's not it's not children like it, you're not going to find this on like ABC kids, but it's also, yeah, yeah like yeah. it's not a late night. Um, but one thing that like, I want to talk about the expansions a little bit because my, like without a doubt, my favorite, uh, my two favorite, like Marvel existing characters, Thor. And I love Gambit. I okay. love the X-Men. Yeah. I think the X-Men are incredible. Gambit is my boy as a guy that does card magic. I was always fascinated by Gambit. And then my love of Thor has grown as I've continued. Um, well, expansions that they have just listed right now, uh, because there are a few. You have an X-Men version of Marvel United that comes with several characters. Yeah, um, yeah like it is fully stocked up i mean the x-men version professor x wolverine storm beast cyclops rogue per, like and then villains you have several villains uh let's see what is it juggernaut saber tooth uh mystique, mystique and, and magneto yeah which is awesome and then you have like you have spider geddon you have uh the multiverse which comes with some different people and then they have like x-men specific expansions which are smaller where you have like one of the ones is blue team and it comes with psylocke gambit uh uh who is it uh maybe rogue yeah rogue and uh jubilee and mr sinister who is a villain who doesn't get talked about that often. And then there's Sebastian Shaw on another one with Iceman. And then Thor has his own like expansion. And if you go with Thor, you get Thor, Korg and Valkyrie and Loki's the villain. So it gets thrown in there. Right. Like y'all so, so many expansion opportunities. And Jason, I'll let you share this. Cause I'm the Marvel guy. Yeah. They just announced, like literally, I think within the last few days, though, they didn't whisper about it, that DC United is coming to Kickstarter or GameFound, another crowdfunding source this summer. Now, like we said earlier in the episode, that means we'll get it in like two years, maybe. <laughs> 2025. <laughs> if we're lucky, it'd be 2025, right? But yeah. DC, and I'm a, I'm a big... When compared to Marvel, I've not I've read very few Marvel comics. I've read a ton of DC comics. And I'm a DC guy all the way, even though I acknowledge the Marvel Cinematic Universe overall is better, notwithstanding Christopher Nolan's Dark Tri Dark Knight trilogy. But they yeah. just announced that. I'm super excited about that. Um, like I said, it, it's it's amazing how many just how many different characters you play. So it's one of those things that if you if you were a Marvel person. It's almost yeah. unlimited, right? You could find so many things, and often when you go back, um, so when the Mar, I, I did not, I did not back this on Kickstarter because I went deep too late. I, I missed the first Kickstarter. The X Men Kickstarter came out, and you still could back the Marvel United Kickstarter. But it was, I mean, the good thing about the when you back it there, you get a lot more characters. So like they are Kickstarter exclusives, you can get thirty or forty characters. Now some cost you like forty or fifty bucks, but proportionally. That's very cheap for how many characters you get. If you went all in, it's like 200 and something bucks and then shipping. Well, I couldn't do that because I have 400 games, right? I'm never going to go through all those characters. Yeah. DC United, because I know those characters, that's a different story altogether because I know yeah. so many characters. I know so many. I've read stories of all these little nuanced characters who that other people like. There's plenty of Marvel folks I had no clue about, right? Other than seeing them in MCU or maybe in a game. 
there's but I know more of those in DC. So there's a really good chance and it'll be the summer, right? That that maybe that maybe that's the next game I buy is going all in on DC United or DC not DC United, DC Heroes or DC United on GameFound because I want all those characters, right? I want to have different um Green Lanterns. <laughs> you know, I want to have Yellow Lanterns. Yeah. I want to have all those guys. So yeah. Yeah. So uh Jason, do you want to dive into uh because uh, I've got one more thought, but I'll fit it into my cookie rating. Okay, so yeah. you want to hit us with your cookie rating? Yeah, my, I, I feel like I, I say this a lot, but I'm being totally transparent. Like if if my cookie rating would be higher if I had this eight years ago with my kids, because we without doubt would play this a ton because it'd be right halfway through the Marvel Cinematic Universe life. Those movies in general are well enough for you know young teenagers to watch. Not a lot of violence, not a lot of bad stuff, not all of them. So we watched all those movies and loved them, right? We loved them so much. And to have that game when my kids were 8, 9, 10, 11, we would have played it a ton. Yeah. Without doubt then, it would have been a double doozy. 100%, like no brainer. Like it's a double doozy, probably one of our top five games ever. But at this point, because of its potential, because of where I'm at in life, it's definitely a chocolate chip, easy chocolate chip. It's one that maybe eventually down the road we'll make a list of the chocolate chip games that get played the least in our collection or the jibba doozies that get played the least because of life. Yeah. Like this is a chocolate chip, hard chocolate chip, but it will rarely get played because I have so many games in my collection, right? And, that, and that's tough. It hurts me sometimes to think about that. That's why we've even lately, when we play a new game, our new thing is basically we play at least twice. Like I leave it on the table. We played Zulkin, leave it on the table, play it twice because often I'll do one and done and not come back to that game for months. And I'm like, I don't want to do that for these really good games. Marvel. Yeah. So like when we, when we bring it, if we bring it out to play it with somebody else or play with ourselves, we'll leave it out and play it a couple of times. But it's a it's a chocolate chip, easy chocolate chip, not barely. It's a firm chocolate chip all the way. What about you, brother? Yeah, so I I think for me it lands in the same place. Uh, like, and it's not from a oh I like my my it's like I don't have as many games as Jason does, uh, so that's nice. But yeah. also like I'm getting introduced to some of these games at a later point in my gaming career our gaming life than Jason did, which also affects it. Right. Yep. But the reason that it's a, it's a firm chocolate chip for me is I think it's the co-op genre is just very, very niche. Like it is its own world inside of board gaming. Um, and there are people who love co-op games. They're here for it. Because maybe they're too competitive, maybe it's their 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 significant other is too competitive, whatever it may be, and this just allows them to enjoy a game without any take that actions, but also really not even like, oh, I flexed on you and I've just beaten you in this game, like type deal. Like we're gonna win as a team or we're gonna lose as a team, right? No in betweens. <laughs> and if I want to introduce someone to the, uh if I want to introduce them to the world of co-op games at this point, Marvel United is where I'm going Yeah, because the IP is so easy for people to jump into. And also like it just plays so easily. And if we get done with a game and they're like, that was kind of fun. We can just turn around and play it again. Yep. Like it's that easy yep. because, and the amount of time it took us to set up and play five tribes we could have easily with Ryan and Abby played two different rounds and had, because we have one of the expansions, we could have literally just taken all of those characters, set them to the side. All right. Nobody gets to use those characters again. Or if someone's like overwhelmed and they're not someone who picks up games fast. Awesome. The three of us are going to go pick a new character. And if you want to stick with your same character, you absolutely can't like when we, we don't own Thor yet but I promise you we will own Thor by the summer. Uh, and I pretty much can assume the next time that I know I'm bringing people over and we're going to play this game, that'll probably be what pushes me to buy Thor. Um, and I just may never play another hero again uh, until I own Gambit. Mm -hmm. And then I might just boop, 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 bounce back and forth between the two of them. Yeah. And that's okay because you can do that in this game too. And the replayability still works because there's me just getting those two expansions is two more villains. And now I have 
six villains that we can compete against. And it's going to change every time. Like, it's just, I'm all about a replayability. And I've said it before. I'm all about a theme that I can dive into. Yeah. Literally, the only reason that it's not a double doozy for me personally is because I am just not a co-op lover. Yep. I enjoy a co-op. And I think that the inability to quarterback this game sets it really, really high. Yep. The only other co-op that I have come back to that I'm excited to play over and over again is Mysterium. Hmm. Yeah. And Mysterium is, it's like co-op yeah. in a sense. Yeah, in a way, yeah. Because you're you're almost, at points in Mysterium, you're legitimately betting that other people are dumb. Yeah. Like, that that is advantageous for you to hope yeah. that other people have messed up. So, and at that point, the co-op kind of turns in on itself because if everyone else has succeeded, you're looking at that person like, get your stuff together, dude. <laughs> uh, like, you're going to literally be the reason we lose this. And I think that could turn people away from the co-op genre. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, that's that's where I, I think we said there was good. I think when we first, when you first played Marvel United, you mentioned this and what you said is that if you're teaching somebody co-op, that's part of the game you're going to use. And I like, I totally agree. When I think through, and granted, I don't have a ton of co-op games anymore other than the OG ones I have, but that's such a good one to go. Because it's so, right, Mysterium is a co-op game, but it's easy to forget it's a co-op game because it's it's not, it is, but it isn't. Not in the traditional sense of Pandemic and Forbidden Island and, and, and Marvel United and Castle Panic is another one we play with the kids. So of those co-op games. So I think that that is so true. And that we we probably won't unless someone asked to play a co-op game, we wouldn't introduce it as a whole again because Elizabeth doesn't like co-op games unless somebody want to do that. Um, but if we did, there's no doubt it'd be either Marvel United or X-Men United because the cool thing about all the United games, they play as, as basically the same. They just add some more stuff like they just released one called the Spider Geddon that is supposed to it's supposed to be like a more complex version but you're still playing cards that have actions on the bottom that you're tagging on to the actions as well but it brings in some other things that start affecting that gameplay in in X-Men United Mystique and um uh oh my gosh Magneto are anti-heroes so you can play them as a hero or a villain that's how they kind of make it still the same gameplay but now thematically if you're an X-Men person I think uh, Magneto, but he's he's good the entire time, right? He doesn't switch to the bad side in the middle, or Mystique yeah. can be a bad or good, right? And, I, and and they're that way the entire game. And who knows? Maybe eventually they'll do it where somehow there's a, that pivot in the middle of the game because they may realize whatever. Um, but that's what they they're iterating enough to make it fun for sure. That and I, this is funny when you were talking, it made me it makes sense the way you describe it. I'm not a smash up guy, but they're tangential in that, like you said, you're playing different characters to accomplish different things against different villains, right? Different goals or objectives. That's essentially smash yeah. up. You have different locations. You're playing different people playing cards. To do now, granted that's a competitive game versus a cooperative game, but it's a very similar concept. I have my deck that I'm trying to do stuff. We're just doing it together. And because of that variability, it's the challenge every time. Can I do it this time? Can I do it this time? Can we do it this time? No. Can we do it with these characters? Knowing their support characters against somebody who needs somebody to hit them. But can we play it smart enough to get around that board and, and win? And if you lose, all right, set it up again and play another 30-minute game. Elizabeth and I, we yeah. played the other day in 20 minutes. And we didn't really play fast. We didn't play slow. But it wasn't like we were just boom, 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 boom. We were like, okay, play. Okay, do this. And then... And then 20 minutes or less, the game was done. Yeah. I mean, I I think that it is like a, that combination. And I something that will always make a game shine for me is the ability for you to play said game and then know, okay, we played this. It was really fun. But if I just own this game, how many times can I play it before it gets boring uh this comes from like family trauma uh when it comes to <laughs> board games which sounds like such a like a heavy thing to say but it happens right, if yeah. you are introducing your families to board games and they are not quick learners they don't pick it up that fast then yeah like there's going to be a game where you've played it and like ticket to ride is one that i love i think it's a great game but family has made that game really tough for me <laughs> to be like I'm so excited for that to hit the table. But like Jason on the complete other side of that spectrum, played yeah. it all that many times, still loves it, still here for it. Um, 
And so Marvel United is one that like truly I think about it, it's a game that if you just own Marvel United and like two other games, you could have a game night every week for two months and still have so like you wouldn't get bored. Yep. No. Which is awesome. I, I totally agree. Like I people we did that for many games. We just had to play the same game over and over. It Marvel United can easily be that way. That the United series yeah. can easily be that way. Totally agree. Yeah. Two chocolate and, chip cookies, and, man. I think we've got I think we hit the nail on the head there. Get a get a yeah. good ratings. It's been a minute since we've had some chocolate chips. I feel yeah. like we have been like really stoked because it's double doozy, or we're like, ah, it's sugar and peanut yeah. butter. Uh like we're hot or cold on these. So y'all, it just shows uh how wonderful this game is. So thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, hope you have a phenomenal, uh, rest of your week and we'll see you in a couple weeks for our next episode. Yep. See y'all then.